welcome to the June meeting of the Village of Southampton Planning Commission. We're going to start here with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We we'll do a roll call. Uh, Pamela Gilmartin. Here. Yeah. Laura Devaney. She, she may join us later by Zoom. Eduardo Simeone. And a Christian Pico. Present. Okay. Bob Essay. Not here. Uh, Michelangelo. Present. Okay. Michael Anderson. Present. Okay. And Mark Shipper, myself. And Summer Stelling, unfortunately, is not here. So we have uh, the first item on the agenda tonight is the, the review and approval of the previous minutes. If I could get a motion to approve it. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, it's good. So we have, we have a few items on the agenda here, but I, I know the first item was uh, to get an update on the sewer committee by Paul Travis, but I don't think Paul could make it tonight. So I will make sure that we have it uh, at the July meeting. I know that they, they did a presentation at the town hall, the town board, and uh, we've identified the site at the corner of, uh, on the Route 39, um, but not too far from the Reed White Lane. So we'll uh, look forward to get an update on this, uh, from Paul and DMB Engineering. There are the latest plans, as I understand, is a much larger plant that originally was anticipated to incorporate more areas to be a sewer within the village, including the, the town hall. So it's something that we'll, we'll take a look in July. The next item on the agenda, we had uh, Trustee Gina Resta was gonna speak about, but I think uh, here we have, Trustee Joe McLaughlin, I think you had the, the debate this afternoon. I think it was a full agenda for the day. So I think uh, Gina also asked that uh, maybe for her to come in uh, the month of July. The next item that we have on the agenda uh, is from uh, Kevin McAllister, who is here with us tonight. And he's gonna uh, talk to us a little bit about uh, his views on the dredging of uh, Lake Agawam and the possible alternative solutions for the disposal of the dredging material. Uh, so maybe Kevin, if you want to make the presentation, be great. Um, come to the podium, I presume? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, commissioners. Uh, my name is Kevin McAllister. I'm founder of Defend H2O. Uh, we're a Sag Harbor clean water and coastal advocacy organization. Uh, by way of my background, um, I'm quite well trained uh, academically in the biological sciences. I have undergraduate degrees in natural resources, uh, marine biology, and my master's of science is in coastal zone management. Uh, before returning to Long Island in 98, uh, spent uh, more than a decade in South Florida working professionally, uh, several years in consulting, but mainly in government. So my extent of the subject tonight uh, with dredge and fill is quite extensive. I was involved with uh, evaluating numerous projects that involve dredging, as well as uh, being an active participant uh, when Suffolk, uh, I'm sorry, Palm Beach County was a sponsor of some of these projects. So I, I've seen it all uh, more recently in my tenure as the Conic Baykeeper for 16 years and now with Defend H2O, I've certainly been addressing uh, dredging, um, you know, largely from the, the impact perspective. But again, my experience in, in this area uh, certainly allows me to speak to it. Um, Lake Agawam, of course, you're well versed in its conditions. I just want to emphasize in a, a freshwater system, uh, the, the limited nutrient is phosphorus. And um, you may not recall this, but of back in 2013, uh, when I was the baykeeper, I commissioned a examination uh, investigation into Lake Agawam uh, with remedies 
Uh, that was performed by Lombardo Associates. Uh, so that report was provided to the village some years ago. Um, two main approaches from that was trying to deal with the phosphorus uh, laden uh, bottom water uh, in a, a filtration uptake uh, procedure um, utilizing some vacant land, but that's no longer possible with the parking area. And then ultimately uh, dredging was discussed as well. Um, with a highly eutrophic system such as this is uh, with chronic blooms, die off the settling, uh, being a receiving basin for the village's stormwater. I mean, there's an enormous accumulation of organic material. And again, the cyclic nature of these blooms. So the phosphorus, which is a part of the engine to these, you know, driving these blooms, ultimately lays in those bottom sediments. And I've, I've watched, and you, you perhaps have seen my letter uh, over the last couple of years, uh, observing some of the procedures, which I would argue is, is treating the symptoms, you know, the discoloration, um, you know, other concerns versus the, the actual disease, which is again, a, a thick organic, uh, bottomland. So in the investigation, ultimately, I think what has been a, a potentially non-starter for the uh, village in investigating dredging is ultimately the, you know, uh, recognizing or, or the mindset that this is all terrestrial, meaning uh, the material is dredged, uh, there would have to be a location for dewatering, uh, ultimately draining off that water. There was a uh, discussion and maybe the, the commission actually heard some discussion on compaction and drying to facilitate trucking. But I, I would argue any way you shake it, I mean, you're talking, uh, you know, uh, enormous volume uh, that has to be trucked off. So, you know, many, many road trips uh, impact to communities, to the neighborhoods, to the roads, et cetera. And of course the, you know, the price tag of all this. So I, I, I believe perhaps that's been a, a bit of a sticker shock. Uh, I would argue that we need to start uh, thinking outside of the box here. Again, I, I've seen dredging in all forms. Uh, I know how it can be a, a very visually dirty operation, which it is, uh, but ultimately we need to start to think about near shore discharge. Uh, so by uh, foregoing any of the handling, if you will, where we are, trying to dewater the material, compact it, dry it, and ship it, uh, but rather a straight jet into the near shore, into the swash zone. And we're talking in the middle of the winter, so you know, uh, January, February, cold weather, uh, cold weather months, the community is not at, at peak here. Uh, the disruption would be uh, minimal. Uh, ultimately setting up a dredge, a hydraulic dredge in, in the lake and, and working uh, after full investigation, and I will speak to that, but ultimately then just a, a, a discharge into the shoreline. So what are we talking about with uh, the bottom sediments, of course? Um, I mean, there's a, a mineral component. So we are talking some sand fines, uh, you know, it depends on the, on the nature of, uh, or the characterization of that sediment. Um, contaminants have to be investigated, uh, you know, what pollutants are we actually dealing with? Obviously runoff is going to bring in a host of things into this repository, as I call it. Uh, and then ultimately to, to assess, you know, the benthic life in the bottom. Uh, so, you know, those three basic uh, investigations, sediment type, uh, the extent of that sediment, contaminants, and then a, a, in a survey, which I have been involved in, and this has really been uh, more, more of a baseline in big projects is to assess the bottom for life. Uh, I suspect uh, because of the chronic nature of these blooms, the hypoxic nature, um, it's a dead bottom. You know, uh, black mayonnaise, you know, I suspect is, is much of the bottom and not supporting life on the bottom. So it's, it's truly not a true ecosystem, if you will, or, or impaired ecosystem. Um, so with the hydraulic dredge uh, discharging that material, of course, there'd be some concerns. And, and I pose the wintertime, obviously, for uh, both the uh, lessened use of the resource, the beaches, as well as the community. But on the blue-green algae, the, the microcystins that have been talked about, the, you know, the uh, potential health hazard and uh, pet hazard, in the dead of the winter, 
uh, between the cold, cold water, cold air, as well as the salinity, the survivability, and I've already looked into this, is, is quite minimal. It, it, you can't have a marine species out in, in uh, I'm sorry, freshwater species out in marine systems. It, you know, there's, the survival will not last. How, um, far, how far out? You think the judgment, the judgment too. This pipe could be placed basically right into the splash zone. In other words, in a straight shot from Agawam, if between Dune Church and the Bathing Corp, maybe there's, uh, you know, uh, between the two properties, I'd, I'd have to see the lay of the land better. But ultimately, you know, a, a, as short of straight shot with that pipe as you could get, you don't have to go extensively into the surf zone because of the wintertime uh, wave climate. With the activation and energy, you know that material will be dispersed very quickly. Um, it's largely organic, so it's going to go into suspension. Uh, it's mud, so it's going to be uh, it's going to smell. You're going to have distinctive odor, of course. Um, the coloration in that water will turn chocolate. Um, but again, with the surf zone uh, and dilution, uh, this material can be dispersed in short order, where a, a really a one-time only dredging event and not to mess around with, let's do a pilot. You mobilize this equipment at millions of dollars a day. Um, you know, let's get in and, and remove the organics uh, in one shot. Uh, and then we're not talking about it any, any longer. So I, I think it's a very plausible approach. I have researched uh, DEC's regulations. Again, uh, in my work, I'm certainly versed in the Clean Water Act, which is federal regulations. Uh, New York DEC in their guidance document for dredging, they don't preclude uh, the discharge or the uh, discharge of, of uh, dredge spoil with contaminants. It has to be defined at, at what level uh, of contaminants, uh, what are the constituents, what are the contaminants we're dealing with, and again, can open water discharges, the sand riparian discharge, uh, be permissible? And that is a, uh, a conversation that the village, and I would hope others that are versed in this, can have with the DEC to, again, inform them, uh, of, again, of their regulations and to really try to uh, ratchet down as to exactly what we're dealing with. So, um, this is this the trustees, though? Uh, don't they have? Stay over the bottom. Oh, the, the trustees, of course, should be involved. This is, I, I thank you for pointing it out. It, it's not exclusive, of course, to the village. This would have to be in partnership with the trustees, the town in general, uh, maybe funding partnership as well, uh, as well as even for that matter, having the DEC Act as a partner to this. So it's, uh, and what are your thoughts on, I guess, timing, right? If we're, we still don't have PRB set up and we're still having an all these inputs coming into the bay, excuse me, into, into yeah. Agawam. So is it a question of timing? Should we be waiting until we have PRBs, if we are considering PRBs, and or, or we have a sewer system in place, mitigating some of the inputs? Well, again, we're um, phosphorus is, is in the bottom sediments. And that's from the agricultural. Oh, that's just history. Years of, of okay. what runs into the basin as well as the chronic nature of these blooms. This is biomass. These are plants that are in the water column. When they die off, they're going back down to the bottom. So you, you have a chronic constant buildup and then a reoccurring release in the warm weather months. So it's, it's the phosphorus in the bottom is an engine to these blooms. So to, you know, we need to be discussing full removal of this material. Again, I would argue that the cost and and uh, time that involved in dewatering and trucking is is uh, cost prohibitive. Uh, so you know if we're going to uh, tackle this issue, we've we've got to think in, in different terms. Uh, again, I think the um, you know on first reaction, of course, the you know the optics, you know muddy water. Oh my God, micro systems into the sea. Well, you know yeah, there's there's going to be the visual, but. When it's done, it's over with. And again, as a marine biologist, I'd argue in the dead of the winter, the implications to uh, ocean, the ocean ecosystem is, is de minimis. Um, you know, obviously the fish stocks, things move offshore. Uh, you don't have the, the level activity near shore in, in the cold weather months. And because of, again, cold and salinity, 
So when it comes to the concern about um, you know, microcystin release into open ocean, um, you know, that's just not a factor. Um, it, you know, it won't be persistent. So I would like to help the village, the trustees, uh, really uh, uh, explore this in a legitimate way because I, I think it's the only way that we're going to resolve again this source. And um, I want to thank you very much for the okay. interesting presentation. We'll thank you for the time this evening. Yeah, we'll I have a quick question. How long of a process is it from beginning to end? I'm not certain of that. Um, it would have to, we, we need to bring in a professional that does this type of work, but ultimately after characterizing the bottom, you know, what, what's the extent of material that needs to be removed, ultimately having then those that are in the, in the uh, industry would be able to tell us uh, what it would take. But we're not, again, we're bypassing any of the second handling. So this is a, a straight shot. I would think we're talking the order of a couple of weeks as opposed to extended periods of time. The, the dredging is something that's being explored by the Clean Water Committee. You know, they, did, they have uh, an engineering firm. I think it may be even DND engineering looking into. And we, what's being proposed here is that instead of trucking and dewatering the dredged, the dredged material, it's to possibly take it into the ocean. So it, it, it's definitely a very interesting suggestion. And uh, you know, we'll definitely report. To the clean water community. Okay, wonderful. All right, thank you, so All right, thank you Mark. Appreciate I appreciate time. everyone's time. Thank you, Kevin. The, the next item that we have on the agenda is uh, we'd like to get an update on the Tree USA initiative. I think uh, Christian was very involved in it. Uh, I think you were too. Yeah, you were too. So if we could get an update, that'd be great. You want to go out? Yeah, I'll take it away. Uh, the Free City USA has four requirements. Um, and we're really essentially talking about public trees. We're not speaking about addressing private trees legislation at all. So I just want to focus on public trees in this discussion today. Free City USA's four requirements are one, that we have an Arbor Day uh, proclamation, which we have had two years in a row. So that's done. A budget in excess of two dollars per capita. Our budget line for trees is thirty-eight thousand dollars. Let me check that box. We need a tree ordinance. That's chapter one hundred seven, which needs to have a revamp. And I'll address that. Work to be done, and we need a tree board. These are the four elements which we see here. So actions that we've taken so far to update this group and the public in this discussion. Uh, Laura Davini gave us all the elements uh, to work on the code. Uh, and I want to thank her, she's not here today, but thank her for all the work that she's put into that. Uh, we have all good elements that uh, we've all had a chance to look at. Uh, Mike Anderson and my left and I uh, met with Steve Phillips uh, with the Fox Department. Uh, and the Fox are the ones who plant the trees. DPW maintains uh, high level discussions, clearly they know policies and procedures in place for coordination between the parks department and DPW. Now, as far as recommendations, uh, a tree board needs to be constituted. And too many boards in the village, too many commissions, too many task force. Board. So the thought is to have it under the planning commission and to have three members uh, to be part of that uh, Tree board. One would be a board of trustee liaison with the box department, so that takes care of the trees. Second person would be a village planner. And a third one would be a member of the planning commission. Having a uh, smaller uh, a tree board uh, is better than having five members uh, where it would be endless discussion. So, a recommendation is to have. So now that board uh, you should work with Alex uh, in council to establish this tree ordinance. All the homework, for all the all everything that we need is there. So that board can oversee the work done by Alex in council to come up with a tree ordinance. Uh, presentation during a BOT, a board of trustee work session, probably necessary, is needed. 
and from there to receive a formal request from the trustees to move forward on that issue. All the recommendations that we have at this point. Any questions? You said one person will be from DPW? No, one BOT liaison with the overseas box department, one village planner, and one member of the planning committee. Yeah, I mean, there could be somebody from either the Fox Department or the DW. They would be invited at every board meeting to tell the board that they cannot. And it's also important to note that, you know, if the village board wanted to have a, a proper tree commission, that we would obviously recommend that as well. But we do recognize the, the history of, of too many task force commissions. That's why we suggested that it would fall into the planning commission. Um, otherwise, Christian and Michael and, and Laura have really done a great job of putting all the pieces in play, and uh, we are ready to assist planner, uh, Mr. Wallet, in crafting some policy um, in our capacity as planning commission members or in the, in the foreseeable future if we move forward with the free commission. Um, so luckily we have a board member here who I know is eager to protect our views. Uh, Joe, do you have anything you'd like to say on this? Uh, I mean to say that I, I think when you put it, we're planning to do this to have a, um, you know, I mean, if you have the tools to cut down or replace this, we do have a uh, lifespan of so 30, 40 years. You have some of the key factors, but you can probably address the tools to be a little bit more to every disease. So we so don't end up with a five dead trees or whatever it has to be. So, yeah. I think that's smart advice. I make. But actually, just give me one moment. I, I would uh, also, I guess, request that maybe perhaps we would have a work session with the village board where we can right. discuss this in a little bit more detail and, and then also have uh, some commitment from the board to pursue this further and work with Alex to capture that policy recommendation. Sorry, Christian. But just, but just, I think that's a very good recommendation. However, I think that you have five members. Would not be so bad. I mean, you could get some expertise. You would have also some redundancy if somebody leaves the board. To have to only three members is a, a minimum, but maybe a little too small. We can let the, we can let the village board, and we can yes, say exactly. between three and five, and, three and five, off, yes. uh, get their guidance. Okay. So, that's a good point. So, I want to address the uh, question you got. Um, <laughs> very good. And um, I know you'd try to send us many planning commission uh, meetings as you can. But we did address all this uh, at the last meeting. I made a presentation. I'll be happy to send you the documentation for this. When I spoke earlier of policy procedures, in fact, the uh, DPW has nothing on that. We went through a 10-point checklist, went through all this. We have 15,000 trees. We know there's about 5,000 that are in desperate need of care uh, or replacement. Uh, we do not have any policy procedures. We know we have to take into this. We know how everything needs to be done. So we laid all this out. I'll be happy to send you the documentation where you can attend by video or YouTube the history of the last 20 years. Uh, Christian's on it. Yeah. Uh, Christian, you have anything to I think that it might be that we have a number of yeah, we, I would consider ourselves being members of the public as many commission members. Well, yeah, but that's too easy. I mean, that sounds like a really tight knit group that nobody has any say in. Uh, I, think I, think that's that's good, yeah. I think that's a huge concern. Yeah. Well, they, okay. they have say in the public process. Village uh, okay. trade commission wouldn't necessarily exist in a vacuum. I think that if you make it a five board member, man, you could have a public, and because of the public, you have to be somebody who is. Has some background or expertise in trees. I just think it sounds like you're speaking without some of that. You make a good point. I just, uh, I mean, I can understand why keeping, I mean, there's just way too many people, but still, yeah, I don't know. We can revise that, we can add. I think we're going to want some input from the elected officials too. As well. They're, they're yeah. going to have uh, an opinion on this and the same as The thing is, though, 
to start working on uh, the tree ordinance, which is a revision of 107. We need to have first a tree board that is committed to doing this uh, and working on it. Um, and uh, uh, that's important. So maybe the our first step is that work session, setting the notion of a tree, bo a tree board, mm -hmm. and then having Alex as well, uh, work with us, follow information to the tree board to begin yeah. for doing this policy. Right. I think a work session should probably be the next step. So, yes. Do we a work session for who? The elected officials. So the elected officials, yes. And we could recommend at that point a five member board yes. make some suggestion as to who we have and have. Some feedback, which is what they're for. Okay. <clears throat> the process is we're trying to get this done by the end of the year. We're trying to get our application and everything that Key City USA needs done. And it has to be trying to uh, file it by the end of the year. So the process needs to speed up and we can get going on it because there's a lot of grant money out there that we're already going to get much large for City USA. Right. And we just don't want to prolong it more than. Yeah. So to uh, point, uh, we need first to have work sessions to come up with a uh, tree ordinance that will take time, several weeks. Trustees need to then embrace it, have public hearings, probably two public hearings. So we're talking about months. And we only have six before the beginning of the year. So we need to work fast. That sounds like a great plan. So do we need to, as a planning commission, vote on this at this time? To, is this something we want to bring to the elected officials in an official capacity? Yeah. Is that our... Yeah, I think that's a good idea. I think that we could make a, one of the promotion that uh, bring to the Board of Trustees uh, a proposal to finalize the application to Tricity USA by the end of the year. And that we take all the required actions that are necessary for the village to complete it within that time frame. Yes, I'd love to make that motion and I'd like you to second it. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. Right. All right. All in favor? All in favor. Aye. Okay, great. The, the next item that we have on the on the on the agenda was a presentation by a village clerk, Kathy Sweeney or Jackie Allen. But I think Jackie was out sick today, so she asked me to postpone it to uh, July. I understand that it's, uh, and I think uh, Kathy was also going to speak to us about uh, the cyber security and the importance of using uh, our village email address in all the correspondence and uh, with uh, all the precautions. Is uh, Alex on the uh, online? Yes. So the next item on the agenda uh, is uh, with our dear village planner, Alex Walla. Uh, and I have uh, two items here on the agenda that we'd like Alex to possibly uh, touch on, but we certainly can ask him other questions. The first one was there was an RFP, a request for proposal for the architectural and historical structure a reconnaissance survey that was due on May 27. So if you could update us on this. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. We cannot see you though. Hey. The, I'm sorry, I'm traveling right now, so I'm not able to turn on my camera. So I, I hope the audio will suffice for now. Okay. Um, but yeah, so we, the village had issued an RFP, a request for proposals for a, an architectural and historical uh, reconnaissance survey. Um, and we did get two responses, which the, the village is now, now evaluating. So the, the next step is the architectural review board is going to... Uh, Alex, we're losing you. Um, and to the interview um, those consultants. Oh, I'm sorry, it may not be great. Can you hear me okay? It's out and in. Hello? Yeah, it's coming in and out, but that's all right. So we only, we only got two responses? That's right, two responses. Well, are they local firms? They are both based in New York, I believe, and have done work um, all over the place. Mm -hmm. 
the, there's a company in, are we allowed to, we have to do an RFP, we can't go out to bid? It, it, it is, it go, it's through the contract reporter. Okay. So it is uh, uh, advertised through the contract reporter to all the states in New York. Uh, I, I'm aware of a, a company that we worked with at the town level from Georgia, I believe, who did historical concepts that did great work with pattern book and Hampton Bays. Right. But so, I mean, I'm surprised that only two person it was advertised. I thought the, the time frame for the response was a little short. I can guess who the two people were. Two firms. Is that right? Sure. That you are, um, I, I thought the, sh the time frame for the response was a little short. So right now, the, Alex, the, the intent is to revive, to look at those two proposals and make a decision. And so the ARB is going to be making a recommendation to the Board of Trustees. Uh, if the Board of Trustees approves, we would enter into a contract um, with one of those consultant firms. Are they? Are the? Are we considering possibly going out to RFP again with and changing some of the language to attract other um, responses? Um, I suppose that would be up to the uh, the ARB and ultimately up to the trustees. They felt like they wanted a uh, a broader scope of responses. Okay. I know we did um, advertise the uh, RFP and we sent it out to certain firms that we thought might be interested in, in responding. Um, but ultimately, these were, were the two responses that we got. Okay. Thank you, Alex. No problem. And I'll mention, um, kind of in conjunction with this, the village had applied to the State of New York uh, Parks and Historic Preservation Department for a grant funding, uh, and we just received word that the village is going to receive $10,000 of a state grant um, to support this effort. So we're very excited about that. That's great news. Great news. Yeah, great job. Are we allowed to ask at this time the two uh, companies that have submitted an RFP or, excuse me, a response to the RFP? Yeah, it's a good question. I'm not sure what the answer is. And unfortunately, I don't have them in front of me. I, I wouldn't okay. be able to tell you. Uh, but if we can, no, I'll follow up. <laughs> Okay, um, and then the other item on the agenda, I'm not sure whether you could also report to us about the, the possibility to accept the, the town license for right now contractors uh, doing work within the village of Southampton uh, must have a county license for uh, home improvement contractors. Uh, and uh, I thought there was discussion with Janice Chair to possibly also accept uh, town licenses? Alex? Yes, I, I know there was some conversation about that. I think that was something that um, some of the attorneys were looking to with a village attorney. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have more information about that, but I know it's something that's being explored. Right. Well, I would encourage possibly if you could maybe reach out to Janice Scherer and uh, see whether an agreement could be worked out. I know that the town has various agreements at that level with the various villages, including the village of Quo, Side Harbor, Sega Point. We have our, all of those uh, villages accept the town licenses. And one of the advantages that in case a complaint is brought against one of those uh, uh, contractors, it is dealt with at the town level with the town to be easier than having to go with the, to the county. So yeah, it'd be great if maybe we could reach out to the town. Any other comments, Alex? Oh, other than I think that there would be an intermunicipal agreement that we would enter with the town. Um, yeah. I know it's being pursued. Okay, exactly. Do we have any other questions for to Alex? Sorry, it, uh, are we talking about <coughs> reciprocity agreement for uh, the landscapers? amongst this uh, to do business in the village, which refers to 77-4 that we worked on a month ago? No. Alex, can you hear? Right. So, is that what we're talking about? No, right, what we're talking about is the home improvement contractor's license. In order to go a permit, yes. whether you do an alteration, every time you do an alteration to an existing house, it does not apply to new construction. 
but it applies for uh, alteration and enlargement of existing houses. In order to get a permit, you have to be licensed. The town has a process that we right. want to be a part of. Right, the town issues its own license. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of the landscaping, that's a very, very good point, because for example, the town of Southampton right now does not require, does not have any special requirement for landscapers, but the town of East Hampton and many other municipalities do require landscapers to have proper training uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, all of the chemicals that are being used in landscaping. That's something else that we could uh, uh, look into to require the landscapers to be able to you know, disclose or require to disclose all of the chemicals that they use on people's properties and so on and so forth. That's at the town because the village has already decided to use uh, reciprocity with the town in terms of permitting to do landscaping in the village. The ship is sealed by legislation now. already a month ago. Was it? Yes. For landscapers? So yes. landscapers? That's part, that's, that was part of the legislation we passed to um, and say the village having their own landscape, their own licensing, we are allowing the uh, village landscapers to use the town licensing in lieu of the village license. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was an actual formal agreement written on that? Not that I'm aware I, of. Well, there has to be. The yeah. question. There has to be, but I have yet, I, I don't know if that was signed if that was signed by the mayor yet. The mayor and, um, the mayor is the only one who can sign a, a contract, so if we have to sign the contract. But the, the, this falls under general business law seven 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 for a home improvement contractors license. There is no special the town does not issue any special license to landscapers. Yeah, yeah, they issue, yeah, they yeah, issue yeah. landscape licensing for landscapers. And the village, the village is, allowed, is instead of doing our, our, our own licensing for landscapers, we're allowing the, to regulate things that are, we're allowing the, the landscapers to utilize the town licenses to, the to apply for the village. Yeah. Yeah. That uh, I, I, there is no special, I happen to also be on, on the town board, on town licensing review board. There is no special license for landscapers. So I think something should be clarified. There is a town license. Is, is there's, a town, there's a home improvement sure. contractor's license that, may that, have been, that, yeah. uh, that landscapers apply for. Right? So it's under general business for seven center. It's not specific to landscapers. This is one thing I'm not involved with at the town, okay. which I'm fortunate. So it's a, it, let's, let's review it further. That's why I'm raising the point. Yeah, yeah I think it's a good uh, point to raise. Yep. I think maybe there may be something. So when it, whatever licensing is needed, the landscapers, when we, when we drafted the, when, when the, when the committee drafted the law, we are allowing the, that, licensing, that licensing to apply to landscapers. Right. To, but, to better regulate the issue. Yeah, but it, it, it's a freebie for, okay, I think we should review it further. I'll, I'll certainly review it a little bit more. But again, it's up to the mayor to enter it. The mayor is the only one who can, enter, who can, enter, who can legally enter, enter into a binding contract with the town. Okay, okay, we'll, we'll review the studies further. All right, thank you so much. So, uh, all right, thank you, Alex. Is Alex still with us? Yes. Yes, I am. Okay, very good, Alex. So, uh, you know, we look forward to working with you on uh, more items, including the, the, the tree ornaments. Uh, you know, you, you heard all the comments we did before about it? Yes, I'll follow up uh, with Mike. I heard uh, most of the, the conversation. And the one thing I'll add, if you can hear, is that we're going to be trying to advance the New York State Dredge Code um, to get the village to, uh, to adopt that. So it's another project we're working on. That's great news. I, Alex, I don't know if you're aware, but I, I'm, I wrote it for the town. So if you need model language on, on top of the nicer to model language because uh, I had to, of course, weave it into the town code, which will be more similar to the village code than whatever the model code is for the state. 
I appreciate that. I shared what the town adopted with our uh, village attorney earlier today. Great. Yeah, very good. It's, it's, this is a great, uh, nice. absolutely. The New York stretch code is a, uh, uh, would be a great enhancement to our community. You know, although it's, it will add a little bit of cost to the construction, and it will require hers rating and, and uh, some additional inspections during construction. At the end of the day, it's a win-win situation whereby the homeowners end up with a better uh, home, better built home, and the community gets uh, uh, the benefit of being more energy efficient. All right, so thanks a lot, Alex. And uh, so the next item on the agenda, we have uh, in terms of uh, updates and news development, we want to make sure that uh, everybody is aware that we have an election coming up on June 17th. And uh, the election will be held at the Cultural Center. And that if anybody wants to vote early, uh, there are uh, forms available here at, with the village clerk. And if we also have uh, forms to vote, uh, I'm not sure if voting online, for uh, absentee ballots also. So you can either participate at the village right now or come on the 17th or send an absentee ballot. So we look forward to having a great participation for this uh, election. So based on this, I'd like to make a Make a motion to adjourn unless there's any other comments. What can comment? No comments? Oh, wait a second. You run an ad in the press, inviting people to come to your meeting. You want to hear their ideas about the planning commission okay. and what's going on in the planning. And we heard nothing about what the master plan is. So the master plan has been, uh, the, the task force has been reviewing the master plan, but we can have a conversation about that. Well, I, what confuses us was an ad in the paper. We put the ad in the paper because it's going to be a presentation about this, column, meeting. this meeting. So we're like, what's oh. going on? No, there, there was an ad in the paper. There was a printed ad in the paper. Um, right. There was a printed ad because we were encouraging people to come to the planning commission to voice their ideas, to bring their about ideas. The master plan and we're about, about any, sure, we could take some of your comments and then we can ensure yeah. that the task force receives them. I just wanted to hear about the master plan. I thought that's what it was going to be. Well, it's, been, it's now in the, under the purview of the planning commission. The master plan is is under the purview of the, what, what is their formal title? Uh, it's a task the force. Yes. Right. Uh, the steering committee and task force. By Bill Mag, Mag uh, Banger. By Does Bill Mag. I understand this, the advertising. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, Ralph. Yeah. Well, the idea is that we want to encourage participation to the planning commission. Well, you, you, wait a second. You want to encourage participation, but you're ready to ensure during the meeting before you ask the public if they had any input. You're, you're right. You're right. We, we, we're out of practice up to two years of uh, no public participation in COVID. <laughs> but, uh, we, I think it's, we should make sure that at the end of our meeting there's a public comment opportunity to hear from you. And okay, so here meeting. I am. <laughs> yeah, well, let's hear it. Come on. Here's the public right here. My name is Lori German. I live at 97 Breeze Lane. I've been a resident of the village since 1982. I would like our bicycle lanes more clearly marked. At one time, we did not allow bicycle riding on Jobs Lane or Main Street. The sign, a bicycle escape or uh, roller skate. Those signs have disappeared, and now we have the farmers market signs in place. So I think it's dangerous. I don't think people know that at one time, I don't know if there's a village ordinance, but at one time there were signs that said no bicycling or roller skating on Main Street and Jobs Lane. There are still, there's still signage in You can't see them. You can't see them. They used to be in the middle of the road, and now we have farmers market signs in the middle of the road. Or at least the last time I ventured down those roads, because I usually don't go down those roads because... So you'd like to see improved signage? Uh, of bicycle lanes. And so you I want to see, uh, just so I understand. Improved so signage of bicycle lanes, bicycling not allowed on Main Street and Jobs Lane. On Main Street between Hampton Road and um, Meeting House Street, Lane Jones. and Jones Lane. Yeah, the it's just that, roads. Just, that, just right the, there. The four squares. It's no, no, no. They can ride their bike down by the fire I'm just, house. And I'm Newton. letting you know about the existing code. Yeah. That oh, okay. There's four roads that it's not prohibited on. Oh. That it's prohibited. 
and Main Street, Jones Lane, Nugent, and uh, I never, I didn't know where that was. No, yeah. It's Nugent, a square. I thought Nugent and the other one were the ones that we were allowed to go to bypass downtown village. Yeah, Nugent, um, you're up. That's but right. whatever. Oh, there's four. I uh, don't know off the top of my head. Right. Okay. Jones Lane, Main Street, Hasden Road, and one, if one other. It's a square. No. Uh, okay, well, and then vaguely. This is another thing. <laughs> About the sewer district. I know he has to put up with me all the time. Yeah, he's a traffic engineer. <laughs> we will talk about that. Okay. So we have diagonal parking. Right. That's another street. Uh, so where's the sewer plant going to be? Out, where the village is going to dump take the sewer outside of the village to the town Sounds property? Like a new location. Right, so right now they identify the property at the corner of uh, um, County Road 39 and David White's Lane, but on the other side of David White's Lane. Uh, and what the happened to the side. behind the police? So that, the, the, uh, the precip that was an initial study that we had been funded about uh, 10 years ago was actually funded by Jay Schneiderman when, he's, when, when he was uh, mm -hmm. at the county under uh, when, uh, Mark Epley was a, a mayor. And that was, uh, a, there was a design under H2N for a smaller plant uh, right behind uh, the police station. Okay, so the so, small plant never got done, so now we have to go to a bigger plant. I'm just well, trying to understand. Yeah, now there, right? there was a sewer commission that was created that then decided to Propose a much larger plant uh, to also handle uh, the town hall, to also handle the school, to also handle, and then have the plant. It was just uh, one other possibility was a, a property next to the, the cemetery, between Burger King and yes, the cemetery. Yes, yes, that. So, so that, that was one possibility. And somehow this uh, possibility, the sewer commission uh, deemed it to be uh, unfeasible. So they went to another site, which is there's a triangle piece at the corner of Hampton Road yes, yes, and yes. Uh, um, Hampton Road. Okay, just as a taxpayer, I'm wondering, we paid for H2M to do a sewer study. Somehow or other, that went away, and now as a taxpayer, we're paying other people to do a sewer study, and we still don't know what's going to happen with the sewer study. Just, this is my That's right. You're, you're absolutely okay. right. You're now absolutely I have right. an, oh, he left already. I have another question, okay? And that is, we already had a pipe going from Lake Adwam under the road to the ocean. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that take care of? Well, that pipe is an overflow pipe. I told you. It's not, it, it's, <laughs> you told me that. it's an overflow pipe that has nothing to do with the dredge soil. The dredge okay. material. But the if it was acceptable, at one time, for that overflow of water to be dumped out there, okay, would it not be acceptable for this dredging to be dumped out there as well? I don't well, think well, we can comment on that. Well, I, that's just yeah, that's my input. I'm just giving the input. Yeah. That's all. Right. That's so my question. Use question. existing infrastructure. Yeah, sure. And okay. there is, a, yes. What what Mr. McAllister was proposing is something that's uh, you know it's somewhat unusual. I think it's something that could be reviewed and should be reviewed by the Clean Water Committee. Okay. Uh, because dredging is definitely something that will solve a lot of the problems sure. associated with Lake Taiwan. Okay. And dredging is, you know, it's, it had been dredged, I think, in the 1950s. They did take uh, a long yards. Yeah, yeah. No disrespect to Mr. McAllister, but I'm not entirely sure how legal it is to, to dump dredge spoil in the ocean and stuff well, like no, that. Yeah. I'm sure the DEC has to say that. Or yeah, that's a, and dredge spoil is highly regulated. Wasn't, so, yes. wasn't there a study done a, a year or so ago on that? By Goldberg? Yes. Yeah, and yes. there's a lot of heavy metals and stuff. Yes. Yes. There's yes. a lot of studies done. Well, you you find studies and, and, and you rule out scenarios. Action. You so know what I mean? Action costs Just tens as a taxpayer, yeah. that's all. No, no it's, a, it's, a, it's a great point. Action, sadly, at times costs tens of millions of dollars, whereas studies might cost tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah. And then that dictates the appropriate action, because we don't want to take an action that is uh, not necessarily the right choice. But it's absolutely true. The, the sewer, there are many uh, components, many views about it. It's so, not, I don't think there is a consensus about 
you know, where should we go in terms of the story. Yeah, I think that there is, a, a, everybody's in agreement that there is a need for uh, wastewater treatment within the villages, within the, the downtown area. That there, you, because the water level, the water table is so high, it's preventing any further development of any uh, other wet use within the village. So there is no question that there is an agreement that some wastewater treatment is needed. The question is that should we just do a small plant to handle whatever is existing here and maybe allow some apartments above it? Or should we try to sewer the entire there are a lot of questions to be asked. Big area. We keep paying to ask these questions. That's well, what I'm getting. You are right. You are right. That's a, that's I think a part it's a of very the good process. Point. I think you're making that's an extremely good point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's how you get it. Okay, excuse me. Oh, thank you very much. Well, thank thank you. You. No, we're glad to have you here. Yes, thank you. And uh, we have thank appreciate you. your comments to remind us to uh, make sure we have a public portion. Are they doing anything with stormwater runoff to control what goes into Lake Agmore? I very, very, very little. There is a very little. Unless you get that under control, what's the point? Well, I think the, they've analyzed the contaminant, contaminants and the percentages and where they're coming from. So I think that's why they're targeting the sewer. I don't know the percentage of the inputs that are coming from stormwater. I think and a, lot of, a lot of stuff the, the abatement processes or um, the mechanisms for mitigation, such as PRBs, thermal reactive bar barriers, and bioswales, are significantly less expensive than doing something like sewer. So there's a lot more, I think, tools in the tool shed for solving that problem. We, we used to, in sewer. fact, they, they put a whole bunch of leasing spaces at Bowdoin Square three, four years ago. Right. I mean, that, that's the kind of thing you want to do. Absolutely. We did some on Hill Street 10 years ago. I mean, I think there are probably some really uh, inventive ways they could redesign Agawam Park to be more of a park for 2022 that has more of an ecosystem than just be a swap of. I think you can put one of those settlement tanks or something in there. Yeah. Right. But I think, they, I think they should series. be looking at because that's probably yeah. where the heavy metals are coming from. Right. Particularly yeah. asbestos from uh, this breaks, right. other breaks. Well, the, the, the village is also now looking. Uh, I think our uh, longtime uh, head of the Department of Public Works, uh, yeah, our engineer, Gary Goleski, is retiring. Uh, Gary's not an engineer. <laughs> Sorry? Gary is not an engineer. You're right. You're right. He's not an engineer. Mm -hmm. He's not an engineer. But we are, the uh -huh. village is looking to hire a new person to replace him. Are you looking for an engineer? <laughs> Worry. No, I was just wondering. I always thought that that position should be an engineer. You're right. You're right. You Traditionally. Know, and, and, and Traditionally, this position and was And not just always. someone who has What about a planner? <laughs> no, but it, it, traditionally, you're hired by, you're hired. The, the, head of, <laughs> the head of public works were always engineers. It's true. Not in the village. The town is, a, is an engineer. Yeah, yeah, not in the village. Right. The village is usually been a matter of seniority. Yeah. So do we have your permission to adjourn tonight? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. Okay. All right, thank you. So I'm looking next year to adjourn. Thank you very much. We'll second it. Yeah, and our, sec our next meeting is uh, July 7th. Oh, I'm busy. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. We'd love to see you. <laughs> so we'll see you all. Thank you. Thank you.